welcome everybody for, for joining us this morning. I wanted to say this is a very special moment because it brings together two shawls, Knesset, uh, Knesset Beth Israel um, in Richmond, Virginia, with my good friend Robert David Usher and young Israel Lauren Cedars here in the Five Towns. And uh, we are joining together for this special moment in celebration of Yom Yerushalayim. I want to acknowledge this, mo this moment and this morning um, the, the, the sponsorship of the male family, Bruce and Autumn, and family who are sponsoring in commemoration today, Bye Bye Yom, on the 28th day of year, the 43rd day of the Omer, uh, upon the 10th yard site of Dr. Sidney Mail. Um, Allah Hashalom, Hamura Mordechai. Simcha Ben Yaakov Tzi, Olav Shalom, and it's a, a special, distinct pleasure to have Mrs. Joan Mayle here, who is uh, who is joining us all the way up from Massachusetts, um, taking off a few minutes to 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 be together. This is a very special moment in in all of our lives. Um, I think this is a, this is a, this is also a special moment. We should never ever forget the uh, the I, the the fact that we live at a time of miracles. We should never forget the fact that we've been to see things which our ancestors would only dream of and could not even imagine would be possible. And it's even though that we're in our homes and we're stuck, stuck in our silos and we feel very dis, uh, disconnected from each other, but nonetheless, we are very much connected. And I want to thank already, already there was over 170 people signed up for this tour, already 80 people are with us now and people will be pouring in. Um, and it's a, it's a very special opportunity to come together to, to get a little bit of a ma'ain, a little bit of a taste. Thank you to Eitan who's going to be uh, leading us today. Um, and we look very much forward to, to experiencing and God willing being there together, but Karov with you. It's a, it's a pleasure. Thank you for about Asha for all the work putting this, uh, putting this together. And Mr. Shem, we should have many more collaborative efforts um, but Karov. My name is Eitan, I'm Israeli. Um, I'm a tour guide um, and uh, speaker once in a while. Um, I wanna, I wanna um, address uh, today and explain um, why I think today is such a happy day and something that's worthy celebration, um, not just uh, uh, a day where we got back to the old city, true, but not only, but many, many, many other things that we are less familiar with. Um, and it is a day where normal life returned to Jerusalem. Um, and I'm going to do this with, um, I'm not exaggerating, about 250 pictures in the next hour, which means that... Um, uh, two presentations are about to go on on the share screen that he'll open up in a second. Um, so and Eitan, I allowed you to share. I allowed yeah, you yeah, to share. Yeah, your screen yeah, now. Thank you. Um, yeah. And I'm going to share hundreds of pictures now. And what, what's important is that you have the box of me uh, there because I'll use my hands here and there. Have on the, the screen, my computer. You can drag it to the left side in a minute when I share my screen, or or drag it to the right or bottom. Uh, if you ask me, left bottom will probably block less. Um, on the left bottom, I think, um, but uh, technology and Corona and lockdown and sites being closed here in Israel. I and I realize it's Friday morning for you, but here uh, Shabbat is in uh, in uh, an hour and twenty minutes. Um, so um, so here goes. I'll try to explain. Um, before anything, before I explain this presentation, I want to address why I'm starting before time. Sometimes you don't appreciate something until you lose it. You don't realize how important it is. Sometimes you need a much broader context in order to understand things. I want to give you one example. Um, there was a prime minister in Israel. I'm sure you remember Ariel Sharon. Uh, he died a few years ago. And Ariel Sharon um, in 1948 was a simple soldier. And he was shot and injured very badly on a very, very hot day in May. And one of the first battles that we had in the War of Independence. And he was, he was thought to be dead on the floor. The other soldiers trampled right near his body. They left him with the rest of the people and tried evicting themselves when they got a retreat uh, order. Now, one guy, a 16-year-old kid, Yaakov Bugin, happened to see him, and he thought, wow, his machine gun is a really a better machine gun than the one I have, so I might as well take the machine gun off the body. As soon as he did this, uh, he pulled the gun off the body. Suddenly, Ariel Sharon gave a little uh, krecht. He gave like a little cry, like, ah, oh. you know, like, and he realized this man is still alive. So Yaakov Bugin, even, even though being only 16 years old, and wearing a blue overall, and he got shot that morning in his jaw, and this was 10 hours later. He was very badly wounded, and he was very thirsty. He couldn't drink physically because he has no bottom jaw. He can't even hold the liquids in his mouth. But he picked up Ariel Sharon, he, and he picked him up and took him, shot him one-on-one -on, -one on the shoulders about three and a half miles away in the heat of 41 degrees Celsius that day. It was 110 Fahrenheit, and he carried him all the way to safety, and he saved his life. 
40 years later, when, 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 Ariel, when Israel had a, um, a uh, person kidnapped by Hezbollah uh, in, in Lebanon, and Ariel Sharon was prime minister in 2005, he released 450 terrorists for him, for al Khan Tanaboim. And the media in Israel asked him right away, how do you release 467 terrorists for one man? And he said, you never leave a wounded man behind. You never leave a wounded man behind. And everybody knew, people didn't need, you know, the, the orientation to understand what he's talking about. People, everybody knew what he was talking about. He, he was in that situation himself, where he was almost left behind. And, and he knows that. And he knows what it feels to, and, and, and it got embedded in him so hardly that, 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 you know, 70 years later as prime minister, he's, you know, 65 years later, he's, he's applying the same thing he learned about himself to other people. I would say the same thing about Yom Yerushalayim. It's, it's hard to explain some of the things you could, but some of the things are really hard to understand how, how lucky we are if you don't realize that we lost them first, if you don't realize. Now, what I want to do now is weird. It's, it's, I'm going to share my screen, and I'm going to apologize. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch in and out of, of, of a presentation. I'm going to be a few minutes on one presentation and then switch to another presentation just so we understand what's going on. And then later, zoom back to the, to the first presentation. So it's going to be two minutes of uh, computer technicality. You're going to see my uh, screen sharing and everything. You're going to see my screen the way I see my screen. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. I'm really, really, really going to try. So I'm turning on right now my share screen, okay? So you can all uh, see my screen, hopefully. Again, the pictures are going to go flying at a, at a very, very high pace now. Um, and uh, hopefully... Uh, Hopefully this is going to be uh, explainable. Also, what happened in 1948, and also what happened in uh, in 1967. Um, now, this is a presentation I made before Yom Zikaron for a lot, a lot of groups I had. Um, but it, it it applies for for what uh, for what we see now. For the general part, it'll make sense. In 1948, in the old city, again the most trivial place, the Jewish quarter. We all we all probably all been there. We've many times even. In 1948, we lost more guys, or the same amount of guys that we lost in Protective Edge in Operation in Gaza. It's 4,000 times bigger in one-fifth the time. The number of soldiers there were not 70,000. There were only 160. Yet we lost the same number. That means if you make a Gaza extract, it would be like that. The old city, Mamila, the following day after the UN come up with some great plan of dividing Israel and, 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 uh, and, and, and I don't know, Palestine into two countries, Jewish and Arab, the Arabs rioted. The Jews were happy all day. They were like dancing in the streets. The Arab newspaper looked like this. Even without a PhD in Arabic, uh, you can understand this down here. Says, it says, Dawlat al which means the Jewish state. You can go to Khan Independence. Enjoy. We're going to meet you right around the block, and we're, we're not going to let you. We're going to take care of you. And Mamila, the following day, which is right near the old city, was full of thousands of Arabs to make a demonstration, which very quickly got out of hand and became violent. And, and they looted all the shops, and they bashed everything down, and they stole everything, and they burnt everything in Mamila. And from that point on, Mamilla was burnt and with British soldiers here. If you look, Alan Canningham, the chief British commissioner, looking at the street saying, oh, dear, oh, my, the whole street was burnt. The whole street was burnt. And he put up guards. If you look carefully now in red, you see a guard standing near a shop, selling out smoke. Because the British at that point were not thinking about Jews or Arabs. or They were thinking, how do I, how do I save, you know, how do I not get involved? I'm going back to London or Leeds in a few months. I don't want to get involved now. It's, it's a little too risky and too dangerous. And from that point, the Jewish quarter was in, in siege. This picture here is people waiting for food stamps. Um, around the Jewish quarter, they put positions around the Jewish quarter. Again, not guarding, aiming outwards towards the Arabs, but aiming in towards the Jews. This is a British soldier aiming in at the Jews. If you look at this picture now, it's again, the Chorva synagogue is in the background. They're making it yellow now. Um, there's a British soldier with a pump on his beret. He's aiming in. He's not watching the Jews. He's watching them. He's looking at them. He's making sure that uh, they, don't, they can't escape. In a minute, I'll explain what he's actually doing there. But the Jewish quarters is a little tiny thing. What does the population look like? Now, before I make fun of uh, some people and get a little humoristic, I want to I wanna make fun of myself first. Okay, the, this kid here who's selling grenades is a, a child. I would probably give him 13 years or lower. That means he's an eighth grader child who's selling grenades in his hands. He's getting five for 20 or five for 10 or something. He's selling grenades. Why not? By the way, if he doesn't have enough guns or, or bullets that are your size, um, you, you know, for your gun or fit your chamber of your gun, you can easily take other ones um, because Saeed Sioux shop down here or, or Abdallah's shop five minutes away also has different types of different assortments of bullets. Um, if you look carefully at this picture, this is what the Jewish quarter looks like. 
This is the National Geographic in 1946 made an issue about the Jewish quarter. This is their cover photo. The people living in the old city were what we call Yeshuv Yishan, Haredi, Hasidic Jews, 2,000 of them. Now, the Arabs were 40,000 Arabs. Now, I'm not the old one, but it was outnumbered so badly, they didn't stand a chance. Like, really didn't stand a chance. Now, you see pictures of British looking for Jews for guns because they would sell to the Arab, why not? And at the same time, you see pictures of Arabs showing off. The, this picture of Arabs showing off with guns fosters to me as an Israeli dearly because the building behind them in the background was the chief FBI of the British. I cannot imagine a situation where a guy would take an Ill illegal gun and take pictures with an illegal, I don't know, machine gun or whatever under the steps of the CIA building, main, main, main federal bureau. Like, like, this is a very, very, very frustrating picture. Now, this is all nonsense. Because the day we declare independence, this is all get filled to fish. It's like the entree. It's, uh, we say in Hebrew, the hummus can. They give you hummus and pita and salad. By the time the main comes, you're not hungry anymore. Because the day they declare independence, the British left. And from now on, you weren't fighting the locals who were just showing off with, with pictures, you know, trying to impress everybody. You're fighting actual people, like an actual army that's coming in. Now, the Jordanians brought into the old city, which is tiny. It's, a, it's the size of two blocks in Brooklyn. That's how big it is. It's 300 by 300 meters, 1,000 by 1,000 feet. How many people they bring in? They brought in an entire brigade, 1,400 soldiers with, with artillery and with tanks and with soldiers and with trucks. You can, you can shoot as much as you want because we will reload. We will fill up as much as we want. We will. And the Jewish quarter doesn't stand a chance. 2,000 Hasidic guys against... Imagine that uh, I'd have one block in Brooklyn of Hasidic Jews against the entire Paratroopers Brigade or Golani Brigade of the IDF. And the Jewish Quarter, what, what it does, it, it, I want to zoom into one, one or, or maybe a, a two or three places. Like if you look here, Lubinsky Post, in the Jewish Quarter, different, they can name different posts after the last names of people that live there. They took over people's houses and they turned them into posts. This one's called Lubinsky Post. If you look carefully at it for a minute, Inside Lubinsky Post, like the street, here's a picture of what it looks like on a Google map picture. On top of that white car in the picture, those, those two windows are Lubinsky Post. That's where the post was. Now, this is not Sderot. I love to compare it over there to Sderot. You know, Sderot, you have a 10 second notice before sirens come off and whatever. This is not Sderot. This is not 10 second notice. It's not, you know, uh, uh, you're, you, have, you have a few seconds to run for cover. If I turn the camera around for a minute and I stand without white cars and I film this way, like the other way, this is what it looks like. The distance between the Jewish quarter and the Muslim quarter over here are, 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 are 31 meters, it's less than 100 feet. Now imagine you're fighting a war and you have two sides from 100 feet away. This is not normal. You, you get shot before you even hear the siren going, you know, before the sound of the bullet even comes, you, you already get hit. Now, I was standing here once comparing it to what, what would a war sound like here. One side would be blasting your eardrum. The other side would be silent. One side blasting your eardrum, the other side silent. You're, con you're convinced. You are literally genuinely convinced that what? That your earphones are broken. You're like, well, what's going on? Why, am I, why, am, why is only one of my speakers working? Why is the other one not working? And, and I stood there a few years ago, and I, and I, and I, and I was like you know, doing this for a group of soldiers, um, educational tours, and... Um, and suddenly an 80 year old man was like leaning on the wall listening. Now, when I have a bigger group of 40 soldiers, I don't care if a random bystander wants to listen, like let him have fun, why not? And he listens in and, and, I'm, and I'm yelling, one side is blasting, the other side silent. And after about, after a few minutes, I, I started walking away. And this guy comes to me and goes, what's your name? I said, Eitan, he's like, you're a tour guide? I'm like, yeah, why, are you looking for something? He's like, no, I heard you talking about the war in 1948. You're, you're familiar with what happened here? I'm like, I'm like, yeah, a little bit. I know what happened here, sort of. Why? He's like, no, I, I heard you talking about it. Do you know what the position was called right up here? And he points right above him. It was right above his head. I'm like, yeah, it was called Lubinsky Post. Lubinsky family used to live there. And that's why they turned it into Lubinsky Post. There was Weisberg and Cohen Post, too. He says, do you know who the commander of Lubinsky Post was? I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. I read his book. He wrote a book about the battle. I happened to read it. He looks at me and says, who, who was the commander? I go, his name was Elitzul Bengu. Why? He pulls his hand out to shake my hand and says, nice to meet you, pal. My name happens to be Elitzul Bengu. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm that guy. My jaw, I was in shock. I was absolutely in shock and, and, and awed. I, I like, right away, I told him, you know what? You, you tell us about what happened here. You tell us your story. What, what do you experience? 
And he looks at me and looks at the soldiers and said, were you in Lebanon war? This is a few years after the second Lebanon war in 2006. I say, yeah. He's like, what were you? I, I was a reservist on the paratroopers unit. He looks at me and says, what, did, what were you given? Now, I'm, you don't see me on, on your, uh, we're through the computer now. I'm, I'm a short guy, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm less than five and a half feet tall. I'm, I'm, I'm relatively small, okay? If we'd be standing in the crowd, three quarters of you guys would be probably bigger than me physically. Now, I was a small soldier. I was given 33 grenades, 300 bullets, 10 clips of bullets, magazines, and uh, two metadol missiles. It's a like really big missile that fits in your backpack, very bulky, and blasts through a wall. Plus, tuna fish and batteries and all kinds of other stuff I carried. This guy looks at me and says, you, you, had, to, you had to stand with, you had three, 300 bullets and 33 grenades and, three, and two missiles? I'm like, wait a minute. I was just part of one, my regiment. 400 guys came in with me. I'm one of the smaller guys. I carried less. Most of the guys carried much more. This guy looks at me and looks at the group and says, you know what? I had to stop the entire brigade, 1,400 people, and I was alone. And all I had was a gun, and I was alone. I had a box of bullets. And at a certain point, I emptied out my box, and I counted. I had 34, 34 bullets that fit my chamber of my gun. 34 bullets actually fit in. If I would uh, want to compare that to, to, uh, to uh, the civilian life for a minute, that would be like me giving you a shekel and telling you, go, go find me a Cadillac, okay? Here's a shekel. Or go find me a Ferrari or something. This is like a, 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 a ridiculous situation where you're fighting and you're nothing to fight with. By the way... I asked him, like, tell us a little bit about what happened here. He says, you know, they, 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 when they attacked, he gave the people a mission, like his, his, uh, his briefing to the few people that came to switch him after two days. He said, don't shoot them. If they break into the Jewish quarter, let them. You have no bullets. You have, there are a thousand guys. You have 30 bullets. He said, don't, don't shoot them. Do what? Shoot the officers. And now, if you look at my little drawing, uh, a picture of me for a second, officers have ranks up here on top of the shoulder. Regular soldiers have, have ranks over here on the side of the shoulder. So he tells them if, if they break in, regular people that have ranks down here, let them. If that breaks up here, shoot them. Try. So maybe we can maybe, maybe, maybe maintain it. By the way, this is a picture of uh, his book that he wrote. And, uh, and this is a picture of him uh, and the book that he wrote. Uh, it's going to be, uh, not, not so. Uh, he, he was 90 years old when he died. He died, he died three, three months ago. Uh, I happened to be there the same day, and his grandson, uh, who was a friend of mine, uh, wrote me a message that his grandfather uh, passed away that day. Um, anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm skipping a lot, but the Jewish quarter slowly leave their homes. These are Jews that were forced to leave their homes. It's not a happy picture. If, if people tell you leave now, you take whatever you have, and you leave. And um, five minutes later, the Arabs break in, and they steal everything. They steal stealing machines and stools and cops and, and kitchenware and everything. Um, this, this picture is before and after picture. This is not in, in Poland or Kishina. This is like in Jewish order. This is before and this is after. This is not one. This is when they were leaving. And this is five minutes later. This picture now is, is probably the saddest one I'm probably going to share. One of the saddest pictures I'm going to share. Here's an Arab man walking with his two wives are schlepping all the loot that they found in, in the old city. They have the booty, if you want to call it. And what happened? They're carrying no, the first wife, the one closest to him. What's she carrying on her head? When I ask this to groups, everybody else says, well, they look carefully at the picture and they say, well, barrels. I, I say, no, it's not barrels. I, I'm assuming most of you have once seen a Sephardi Sefer Torah. She's stealing three Sephardi Sefer Torah. I don't know if to make new leather lining for her shoes and, or I don't know if for what reason, but she has with her three Sephardi Sefer Torah, maybe for the silver, you know, for the decorations of silver. She's, I don't know why that's what she's looting. That's what she's making. That's not fun. Now, I'm sorry, I'm skipping a lot, a lot, a lot. I want to get to 1967. What happened here in the Jewish quarter? The people were buried over here. A, I, I always share one story when I'm there of, of one girl in, in the picture, Esther Kallengold. She wrote to her parents a very, very sad letter a few hours before she died. Her best friend died a day before Mayor Steinberg. And she realized, I might, I might not see my siblings. She was a lone soldier. She was from London. She's a Holocaust survivor from London with the, you know, Hitler bombing it nonstop. And she came to Israel to teach English. And when the war broke out, she fought them. And she joined the IDF for was not the IDF, but not the IDF. And she joined it. And the day after her best friend died, she got really got the wounded. And she was her parents. She was taking her and her, by the way, next to her friend. They were not being buried here. And the last she writes to her parents, she writes to her parents, don't be sad about any, any sad. She finishes the letter. She writes, don't be any sadder than you must. 
If you meet one of my friends who survive, if I don't, I know that you feel proud of me. So don't be sadder than you must. She's telling her parents, be proud of me. Because we fought for a great cause. And I'm convinced that one day, maybe not now, but one day, we're going to have a, a Jewish state. And we're going to be back in Jerusalem. From there, they went very, very closely into this area, which is the only place, it's a big square today. There's two schools there. This used to be then the only square in the old city. The other one uh, used to be a residential area. There wasn't a square. This one was. This is actually a picture of what it looked like in 1940. And they squished 1,800 people in there and they surrendered. The people that were still standing on their feet were, were, were there devastated. 67 people were killed. 48 old bodies only were retrieved. 19 bodies until today. The family has no, no grave to come and say Kaddish next to because they don't have a grave. And what happened? They squished all the people and they told them a very, very, very terrible thing. They told them, listen, guys, we don't want we don't want the women and children, but the men, we are taking you as captives of war. We're taking all the men, ages 15 and up, we are taking you all to prison with us. Now, this sounds terrible to a lot of people. They say, wow, it's only a few years after the Holocaust. You're separating families again. This is not the reason that they were so, this is a such a terrible thing. The reason this is such a terrible thing was because these people, two weeks, the Jordanians, two weeks earlier conquered a Jewish kibbutz. I happened to live right near Baitan and Gush Etzion. Kibbutz Kfar Etzion, when it was conquered, they took 154 people and they told them, guys, you're going to prison. And what happened is, is they told them, guys, squeeze in for a group photo for a minute. Now, every one of them wanted to be in that photo. So if they have some friends, Almost all of them, by the way, were Holocaust survivors. But if they have a sibling left, if they have cousins who, who survived, let them know alive. So everyone wanted to be in that group photo, everybody. And what are they doing? They're squishing into that photo, squishing in from, from all directions. And what suddenly happens? An Arab opened up, two, two Arabs opened up machine guns, and they shot them all. Now, to these people, to you, it's history from many years ago, 70-something years ago. But for these people... In this plaza, that, that's the same Jordanian army. It's two weeks earlier. What do they do? The prisoners, they shoot them. It's as clear as day. Can you imagine a screaming of a nine-year-old girl who sees her daddy standing 50 feet away from her and is screaming top of her lungs, Abba, and realizes she's never going to see her daddy again. She knows exactly what's going on because she sees her mother freaking out, yelling, Zama, Zama, trying to make her husband unsuccessfully. Her child, her older, older son and husband sometimes were there. They took everybody from age 15 until, until 50. And, and not one, two. Imagine a screaming of a nine-year-old kid. Yeah, screaming yeah. Abba for... Imagine the screaming of a nine-year-old kid one, one time. <laughs> screaming Abba. And I multiply that now by 900. Because there were 900 children screaming one thing. They were screaming Daddy, Abba, for the very last time. And they saw them out of the line and they told them, guys, and they hold, you know, stand here, but the women were kicking you out. And they took all the women out and the children, and they were convinced that they were going to die. These are all the women and children. They're rounding them up. And these are people five minutes before sitting there inside of the leaf, sharks, yelling to the gate, never to see those again. Uh, the picture I'm showing you now, it's, I look all the time at the bottom left picture that you're looking at, the bottom left side of this picture. I see a girl who's screaming Abba. I don't know how old she is, 12 year old, 13, maybe 14, screaming Abba, looking back one last time at, 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 at the Jewish quarter, looking at what used to be her home and now, and now is gone. And now is gone. And we lost the Jewish quarter in 1948. We didn't survive over there. We didn't hold up. Now what I want to do to you now is show you what happened right after this. A few months after there was a war raging in Jerusalem for a whole year. An entire year. What we just went through is almost a half a year. Now I want to go into what happened. Um, what happened the rest and I'm in, uh, in Jerusalem right after or towards the end of that war. And what I'm doing is I'm zooming into a second presentation. Okay, one second. Um, some of you guys show me with your head. Can you see the picture now? Does it show up. Okay, yeah. okay, beautiful. Okay, if you look at this picture here, it says danger. The enemy is ahead of you. Okay, Shetah the enemy area ahead. En ma'aval, no trespassing. So it doesn't say it in English, but in Hebrew and Arabic it does. What's important is not that sign, which always catches people's eyes. 
What's important is the background. The background is the old city. That's the Tower of David. If you've been to Mamila, it's the end. That's Jaffa Gate. That's the area. The old city was off limits. The old city was, we lost it in 1948. And when they, the war ended, this historical picture happens. The guy with the eye patch on his eye is called Moshe Dayan. I'm assuming a lot of you know him. And he was then just a regular general in 1948, a colonel. And he sits with his friend Abdallah, the guy who's a little balding here in the picture, and they both take out a pack of crayons. I'm assuming I have a picture here for Israelis because there is no word for crayon, by the way, in Hebrew. It's, there's like a word, tzvaim. there's no word for crayon. And, it, and they both go and take a map of Jerusalem the size of a printer page, like an A4 printer page. That's how big the page was. And what they do is they draw on it where their soldiers are exactly located, and they draw their area, um, and, they, and they draw the area that used to be theirs. By the way, I'm seeing people here on the chat box because it's popping up. Um, I, I'm not sophisticated enough to look at the same time at the chat. Um, Eitan, so really... if, uh, Eitan if, you, if you make me the host, I can mute people if people are, if you're hearing background noise. I don't I know. I, I'm, 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 everybody here should try I'm, to put I'm, themselves... Michael, you want me to move it? <laughs> everybody um, can put yourself on mute. Okay. Or Aton, you can make me the host and I'll mute everybody. How do I make you the host? Maybe that's a better idea. How do I make you the host? Um, if you scroll over my name, you should see options for me. Um, okay, scroll over your name, options, make host. Beautiful. I made you host. Okay, yes. Do you want to change David Asher to host? Yes. I okay, hope I still have the screen sharing option. Okay. Yes, you do. What, right. they, what they what they did. I'm going back to the presentation. What they did here is they drew a really famous line. Now I'm assuming most of you have heard of the green line. It's obviously because Moshe Dayan picked up a crayon that was green. Like, you know, the crayon in the box? Um, he picked up a crayon that was green. By the way, uh, uh, Rev. David, my screen froze now. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, the, the old city was left in the Jordanian hands. I don't know if you can tell the lines now. Um, it was left in the Jordanian hands. The city was divided in half. They literally divided the city based on where they had soldiers. Now, these two generals... If you look at this picture that I'm showing you now, it looks a little absurd. If you look carefully, you'll see an Israeli jeep and a bunch of Arab guys looking right across at them. The distance between them must be, I don't know, 35, 40 feet. They're right near, they're, they're like 10 yards away from each other. And they're, you know, they, they see each other every single day. How do you divide a city in such a, a, a really, sorry, silly way or fashion? How do you do that? How does that happen that you do that? The answer is very simple. When these two gentlemen, and the picture you're looking at now, drew a line with crayons on a map of Jerusalem the size of a printer page, it was very, very clear to them that what's going to happen, that diplomats are going to meet eventually. Take a few, you know, a few days, a few weeks, most, and they're going to meet and they're going to make a normal agreement. They're going to, you know, sign in and they're going to decide how many, with paragraphs, how many soldiers you will have in Jerusalem, how many not, how many tanks, if missiles, if not. And, and, and it was very clear to them that they're going to draw a map as temporary. It's not going to hold up, you know. They're going to make a permanent map, the diplomats, in, in a matter of time, matter of maybe days, maybe weeks, at most. What they signed a map, which was so, you know, for them temporary, ended up holding, hang on tight, 19 years. Now, I'm going to show you some problems in this map, okay, which, oh my God, are problematic or situations that we laugh at today. First of all, if you look at this map schematically, it's easier to look at. Where it says on the right side, Howard Sophim, for those who read Hebrew, that's the university campus and hospital. Imagine you divide Jerusalem and you suddenly go, oops, I forgot the university on the other side. 11,000 guys want to study chemistry and biology and physics and I don't know, you know, law and can't go to school because we forgot the school on the other side. Hadassah, the, 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 the university was forgotten on the other side. More problematic than that. The hospital, Hadassah Hospital was located where it says Howard Sophia. It's a little tiny isolated thing in the middle of Jordan. Once every two weeks, they would have a convoy of a few soldiers to go and guard it because status quo, it was ours. But bottom line, like what, what, uh, like they forgot on the other side. Now, think about that for a minute. That means if you need to get the medical procedure, you need to get dialysis, you need to get anything, like you can't do it because they forgot on the other side. That's a big oops. Now, this situation, by the way, the Arab road leading from the old city to Bethlehem, south of Jerusalem, happened to go through through West Jerusalem, I have to go through the green right now. So that means all the guys that want to go visit their cousins suddenly can't because, you know, it's a 20-minute drive normally with no traffic, with traffic half hour. 
suddenly they can't go. They're like isolated. They can't, they, there's no roads leading there. There's dirt roads, you know, if you have four by four, you can go around. But what if you have a regular car? You can't. Now, if I, if I look at a more clear map, this is uh, a little, uh, uh, the guy who made this map made it blue. It's actually a green line. This is a very, very precise map of like where, where, where it actually was. Now, what I want to do is zoom into one or two things here in this map, and you can understand how wack wacky the situation was or how weird it was. You guys see a yellow arrow now looking? I'm zooming in for a minute. The building that you guys can see now, and in the, in, in the end of the arrow is pointing at, or the squares the arrow is pointing at, that's a Notre Dame church. The Notre Dame church is standing till, till today. It's a really nice building, and it's right by the old city. How close to the old city? That's close to the old city. If you look at this frame of this picture I took last week, okay, on one side, you see the old city wall. On the other side, you see St. Louis Hospital, the building with the blue shutters, and next to Notre Dame church. Those two things are part of the Notre Dame complex. This, it is 20 feet, 30 feet at most, away from the old city. That's close to us. Now, in night, by the way, from the roof, it's over the old city. So you can really see a beautiful view. This is a picture of the 1950s of what it looked like from there. It's a little hard to see, but there's, there's two arrows now. One is aiming at Dome of the Rock, which you can clearly see, and one is Churchill Hay Sepulchre. The view is stunning. And a nun was sitting up on the roof, enjoying the view, looking in May of 1954, a nice sunny day. And a second nun came to her from the back when she wasn't expecting it and gave her a slap on the back, said, hey, what's up? How are you doing? You know, and she wasn't expecting it. What happened to this 65-year-old lady, she had dentures. She had fake teeth. And her teeth fell out the window, fell, fell four flights down. Now, there's only one little problem for teeth fall, which is that building is on the green line. I mean, the building is in Israel, but one foot away from the building is not. And, and she had no teeth. So what did she eat for breakfast for a few days? She ate Cocoa Puffs or, you know, uh, cornflakes, but she didn't eat it right away like normal people do. She poured cornflakes and milk, and then she waited for like an hour. She went to go do her laundry, went to go read some books, you know, went to go read newspapers, and she's eating for like a week soggy cereal. It's not fun to eat uh, soggy cornflakes uh, for a whole week, but that's what she did. And after a week, she couldn't take it anymore. She went to Chief Nun and said, you know, my, my teeth are, ah, my teeth are down there. She's pointing down the roof. She's pointing four flights down. My teeth are over there. What do I do? And she has, this is before emails. This is actual like letters with a stamp. You, I'm assuming you guys remember that very well. They had to send those to the UN to Jordan, to send them back from Jordan to the UN, back to Israel, because we wouldn't talk to each other, to get permission to cross the fence by what, two, three feet to go get our teeth back. But when they did this, Life Magazine, Time and Magazine, and Newsweek, all brought photographers. They thought this was hysterical. Here's the picture that they took. Here's a Israeli soldier escorting a French nun to go find her teeth back. Now, this is, I'd like to remind you how close it is to the old city. It's 20 feet away. This picture is taken from the old city wall, 30, 40 feet away from them. There are snipers on there. There are maybe bombs or, 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 or more, or, you know, uh, mines, landmines over here. It's scary. I'm assuming nobody, nobody here would want to go in this romantic walk with me if I tell them I'm going in a minefield. And what happens at the end is a bittersweet ending. They didn't get hurt, but they couldn't find the teeth. So the Yelta Jordanians on the wall, hey, can we get a few more guys down here? And they said, fine. And what they did is, there's a few guys, a guy on the right side over here with a, with a white flag, and a bunch of nuns and soldiers looking through the weeds, looking to see if they can find ladies' teeth. Happy ending. They actually ended up finding a teeth. Here's a nun showing off, you know, her teeth to all the, all the cameramen on the wall. Hey, look, I found my teeth. By the way, when, when a lot of photographers come and they take a picture of one, uh, you know, person, what everybody does is, is photo bombs, it's called, and, and, and slang. It's like coming in back and being part of the picture also. So all these really, you know, soldiers getting with the nun in the picture, and they all take it in. If you look carefully in that little tiny thing, I zoomed in. Trust me, that little tiny thing in red, the, that, that's the jaw. That was her teeth. Now, it's, it's not only – I learned a new word uh, in English. It's called devious. Like, I'm actually Israeli. I, I speak American because I'm a tour guide. But uh, – um, but uh, this is newspaper articles. There's, they're inside the old city, right, uh, right by the old city, right by Jaffa Gate, like right above, literally, by the, where the train tracks are, where you're looking at a little tiny circle, hopefully now, if it's showing up properly. For me, my screen keeps being blocked every second. There's a school called Fair School. It's there till today. If you're by the old city, that's what it looks like. Now, all the kids play, Arab kids, Palestinian kids, if you like. They play soccer outside. And, and what happens is that their balls fly over the wall every time. Like the rolls always fly over and it's frustrating. So for Christmas of 1964, they wrote Israel a letter saying, listen, it's been 10 years since we let you go your teeth back. Like when, when something went wrong for you, we let you. 
will you please let us cross the fence and go and find, uh, you know, get our soccer balls back? Israel agreed, but under one condition. The Jordanians asked what? They said, well, only if it's an Israeli soldier who crosses into the minefield and goes to find the soccer balls and kicks them back, and not a Jordanian. The Jordanians said, you, let us get, let's get this straight. You want to risk an Israeli soldier's life to go get their soccer balls back? And Israel said, yes. And they said, go for it. I'd like to remind you, walking in a minefield is a very risky, uh, risky thing to do. Well, Israel took a guy and they patted him up. I, I took a picture from the internet of what a minesweeper looks like, just so you guys get an impression. That's a guy laying on the floor with a metal detector, going like that again and again, back and forth. Now, every single time he was by the school and he found a soccer ball, he, he stood up and he kicked it in. And this building was full of Arab kids that were all chanting and yelling, yay, we have another ball to play in recess. But every single time he found a, a mine and his machine went beep, he played with his helmet a little bit. He moved his helmet a bit. And, and, and that way we had people on all the buildings around it, surrounded with buildings, all looking at it with, with big, you know, photo up, uh, big uh, aerial photos of the area. And we mapped out and they put a little X on the map. They put a little, you know, circle or something on the map. We mapped out the entire minefield because we let an Israeli soldier go in there and tell us where all the mines were. This was coordinated and planned. Now, if I, if I look at this picture, this is a very classic picture, like very, this is, a classic thing to do in, in, in the 50s and 60s. You see people here are taking a picture of something far away in the distance. I'm sure some of you can look in the distance and see this was the only place in Jerusalem. Abu Tor, the neighbor, the corner, if you know the area, Rehovam Faked and Abu Tor, that was the only place in the old city. The old place, sorry, in, in, in the new city, which you were actually able from Jer Jewish Jerusalem to look in and see the Dome of the Rock to see the Western Wall. It was the only place you really could. Now, there was a place called the uh, Kever David, like the roof of David's uh, tomb, where they would do all the ceremonies and they would stand there and pray there and everything, but they wouldn't actually see it. They, people would stand there and want to see it and tell their children, you see it, you see it, but they wouldn't really do, see it. Here, they actually would see it, but they were really, it was, it was a frustrating situation. You see it from far away, you can't come. Yitzhak Shalev was an Israeli poet and he compares, he writes a song in 1953, he writes a song, Gag min zaman tal dam hayali kenevo, et kodesh shere velav lo avo. In English, that would translate to the roof of Notre Dame Church, that church we saw before overlooking the old city, for me was like my, my Mount Nevo. Mount Nebo, Nevo, is where Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, comes about to go into Israel. He's dying to go in. Nobody in human history wanted something more than he wanted to come into Israel. And he wasn't privileged enough. Why? God tell them, hey, you're, 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 you're done with your role. Go, go up here and die. And he, he never set foot in Israel. There's nobody wanted something more than he wanted to come into Israel. Uh, and and, and Yitzhak Shalev writes, this poet, 1953, writes a poem. He writes, for me, standing at far, looking at it, was like, well, like Moses, Mount Nevo. I look at it from far away, and I can't, I can't approach it. Now, the thing he writes in, later in that poem, he writes, what do I tell my grandchild who asks me to take me to my grandfather's grave? Because maybe the most painful thing that we lost in Jerusalem, in all of East Jerusalem, besides the university, they can build an alternative. And the hospital, they build an alternative. That's why we have two campuses, by the way, today, the Hebrew U, Givat Ram campus and Howard Sofim campus. And we have Hadassah, we have two hospitals. 1949, they built an alternative, Hadassah and Karim. Because we didn't have Hadassah, Howard Sofim, Hadassah, Mount Scopus. But what they do over here, the most painful, which does not have alternatives, are people's graves. Right behind the old city, if you look carefully, there's Harazay team. Now, just to orient you, where Harazitim, the Jewish biggest cemetery in the world, is 250,000 guys are buried there, roughly. If I, if I look at a map of where it is, it's over here. It's deep, deep, deep in the Arab section. Now, what, is, what does a Jewish cemetery look like 20 years behind enemy lines, behind the Jordanian lines, when we were enemy countries then, before Rabin signed the peace agreement with them in 1994? This is way before. What did it look like? I'm showing you some pictures. I apologize. They're, they're a little painful sometimes. This picture here is a bunch of, uh, you know, Arabs knocked some rocks out and turned them into terraces. These are Arabs who knocked rocks out and turned into steps to go to their, I don't know, new terrace or the backyard or something. It was a little elevated. They built a few steps. These steps, if you look carefully, are made out of Jewish tombstones. People made fences for their house. Would they make their fences for their house? Made out of Jewish tombstones. It's, it's easier to take Jewish tombstones to, than to quarry out rocks from, you know, or, you know, they're square already, they're made, it's much easier. 
the pictures that frustrated me the most, by the way, were the pictures Jorda Jordanians did. The picture of Jordanians did, this is a Jordanian army camp. If you look carefully, on the bottom is the floor, and in the back there's a wall. What's the wall made out of? This is not an iPhone. You can lift it and put it in your pocket. It weighs, I don't know, 200 grams or a few uh, ounces. This is like a 200 you know, pound thing, every one of these tombstones. You have to get four or five people to lift it together and to load it on truck. And by the way, this picture was taken in a, near Modi'in in a place called El Kubaybe. For those who don't know the area, it's a half hour drive away from Jerusalem. That means a, a official in the army, in the Jordanian army, had to go tell his soldiers, go, you load, take apart those sections in the cemetery and load these trucks with it. And after a few hours of work, then they drove away and they built the army camp deliberately with these stones, not even facing them out, you know, so you wouldn't see the writing, deliberately facing out, not face in. This picture is a, is a very, very sad one. If you look now, this picture here is a, a path made out of Jewish tombstones. One sec, I'm drinking. Sorry about that. Um, if you look carefully at the end of this path in a Jordanian army camp, what I circled now uh, made a little square around in yellow, it leads to a bathroom. That's an outhouse. I'm part of my language, a Jordanian soldier where he goes to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, if he has to, he doesn't want to put on his boots because he step on gravel and it's very, very irritating. So he makes a path of stones, but he takes two tombstones to make that path. I, 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 can, I don't have to play with the contrast in this picture. I can look at the bottom I don't know how many of you read, read Hebrew well. Ponitmena, Peinun means Ponitmena, here's buried. Imenoe Kara, our dearest mother. Haishat Snua, the modest lady. Lipshko Oman, Shabbat Levit Tzvi Echezke. It says that on the grave. Read, read upside down, but it says it. Can you, I mean, can you imagine the pain that people know that Jordanians are, sorry, going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, trampling on their graves? This is not a fun situation. This area of Harez Etim that I'm going to make now in yellow between these two memorials, Yad of Shalom and Karavis Hayat, these two graves, if you look carefully, that whole area, they, they, made a, they made a gas station there. How do you make a gas station on top of the cemetery? You take a lot of dump trucks and you put down earth on top and you make a big podium sort of on top because it's a slanted area. If you look at this picture now, it's, they just took it and they, they, they covered it with sand. By the way, six years ago is when they finished excavating it, re-excavating, reopening that section of the cemetery. But for the past 50 years almost, it was... It was underground. People had graves. They're, they knew the grandmother was buried in that area. They didn't know exactly where, maybe, because it's under that area. Okay, it used to, it used to be part of that uh, cemetery. Now, if I look at uh, Abu Tor, this area south of the old city, this is maybe maybe the most wacky neighborhood in Jerusalem because the actual neighborhood was divided in half. I take groups to uh, to a street there, Rehov Asayel. It's called. It's a one-way street. It's very narrow. It's got a sidewalk maybe of one foot wide on each side. It's a very narrow side. You have to walk on the road. And I, and I cross the street with people in a group, and I ask them, do you notice the difference? And they tell me no. And I tell them they just crossed the green line. They crossed from what used to be Israel to what used to be Jordan. Now, I'm going to show, show you a picture of what it used to look like. Okay? In Abu Tor, in that area, here's a picture of what, what the neighbor used to look like. Okay? One side was Israel, and one side was Jordan. The lower side was Jordan. One side was Israel. There was a little tiny barbed wire roll in the middle. Now, most of the time, things were really, like, calm. They, they weren't, you, you only hear about, you know, when things get really out of hand. You, I'll give you an analogy for Gaza. We only hear about Gaza like it's a very horrible place. 90% of the time, the area around Gaza, even 99% of the time, is a beautiful area. Once in a while, when things get heated up, you don't want to be there. When there's an operation, you don't want to be there. When they start shooting a few hundred rockets a day, you don't want to be there. The rest of the time is beautiful. Most of the time, things are great. Relationship are great. People used to go out and play, not play together because it was a barbed wire fence, but do shopping. People on the Israeli side used to go and shop on the Jordanian side because it was way cheaper. You used to yell, Mustafa. You used to yell, what? You used to yell, give me pitas. You used to throw them a dinar or, or a dollar and you used to throw you uh, two bags of pitas or, or hummus across the border. Here's a picture that's exemplary of how down this road on the bottom, there's an area where you guys can see the situation. It's It's... Pardon me, it's a little crazy. One side, you have an Israeli soldiers. You have guns and everything. You have Israeli soldiers doing a patrol. The other side, you have a Jordanian with a gun doing a patrol. They're meeting each other every day. They're probably kvetching and complaining about the situation and uh, uh, the weather and whose commander. They're comparing whose gear is more uncomfortable and whose commander is more annoying to him that day. 
Now, I got news for you. Statistically, about 97% of soldiers in the IDF I sometimes smoke. I'm, I'm the only, my company, Reserve Duty, there's 88 people. I'm the only one who doesn't smoke. That's how bad it is in Reserve Duty. Now, I'm, a, I'm telling you these people in the picture probably smoke. The Jordanian in this picture probably also smokes. Now, now if, if, if they smoke and he smokes, where do they buy cigarettes? Cigarettes in Israel cost 35 shekel every packet. In Jordan, how much do they cost? <laughs> like a shekel, like 30 times cheaper. So where do they buy their cigarettes? Across, obviously, by Abdallah here, who gives them cigarettes every day. But instead, one day, they say, wait a minute. I can, they scratch their head and say, wait a minute. I can give you 100 shekel, and you give me 100 packs of cigarettes, a whole carton pack of 100. And I can sell it to my friends and make a lot of revenue. I can make a lot of money. Uh, that insight sparks. And, and this guy here on the right side, Moshe or Yaniv or something, he goes and tells Abdallah, Abdallah, give me 100, give me 100 packs. He gives him a 200 shekel note. And blinded by the money, Abdallah says, thank you very much, and puts it in his pocket and walks away. He just earned a really nice sum of money for Jordan. And, and he just stole the money. Now, within five minutes, these things become yelling and become spitting and become, by the way, all our curse words in Hebrew, unfortunately, are, half of them are in Arabic. So Abdallah understands Arabic very well. And five minutes later, what do they do? They curse each other out a lot, and they pick up rocks and throw. And I'm not talking about a little pebble. I'm talking about, you know, rock football sizing up. They, from this distance, it's not so hard. And five minutes later, they start shooting. And when everybody starts shooting, all everybody, seven miles of border light up right away. Everybody runs. Jordanians run to the old city walls. Israelis run to their positions behind walls, and everyone starts shooting everyone. Seven miles of border in Jerusalem escalate because of one fight over a pack of cigarettes or some argument people had about something silly. And five minutes later, everyone's shooting. Jerusalem filled up then in those years, in the 50s and early 60s, it filled up with signs. This sign says Zayrut, which means caution. Salafim, they're snipers. A sniper is a guy with a big scope on his gun who can aim very precisely. It says danger snipers, don't walk in the middle of the street. Not because of buses, not because of taxis. Don't walk in the middle of the street because if you do, you might get shot. Okay, this sign, these, these signs here in Jerusalem, the one on the left, Okay, it says danger, the enemy can see you from here. For those who know Mamila, Mamila has a little curve in it. This is a sign that that curve was, where Cafe Ramon is today. Because before that, you're not exposed, but after it, you are. So be careful if you are, because now you're exposed. The enemy can see you. Be a little more cautious from this point on. Stay behind shelters if you can. The sign on the right is a sign all Israelis, I ask them to read it, and they all get it wrong. It says Sakana, which means danger. The enemy may see you from here, can see you. If you move forward, all Israelis always read this as tira, shoot. But it doesn't say tira, it says tiare, you'll be shot. It says danger, the enemy can see you. If you move forward, you'll be shot. That, these are signs in Jerusalem all over. The, the area, the area where, I'm, where I'm showing you now is Mamilla Street. I'm going back for one second. I made like a block line to illustrate where Mamilla is. You walk on a street and it ends by the old city. Today we can walk in. Then obviously, you know, the whole end of the street was demolished and, and, and you can't get near. And the whole thing was gravel at the end. Now, I'm showing you a picture of Mamilla, of what it looked like, but a picture taken from a photographer who stood on the old city walls looking in to the Israeli street. Okay, here's a picture of it. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm demonstrating for one second with me. If I want to look down at my palm of my hand, sorry, that, that's like, what, that's like what, what it would be like to look at, uh, to look at, uh, to look at Mamilla Street. It's like right there. It's like, you're looking down at it. You're higher than it. Living on the street was very challenging to say the least because it was risky, it was scary. If you live in this area, people start shooting at you. You know, so, so what happens is this street overgoes changes very, very, very quickly. By the way, people are asking me, hopefully I'll be done in 15 minutes, okay? So we're almost an hour now, it'll be about an hour and 10 minutes and hold it up with a 70 minute time. Um, so I'm showing you the same picture, this picture taken from a Jordanian post. Now I'm, I'm circling like a few things to notice. I always play games. I always tell people to look at this picture carefully. But if you look at the left side of the picture, it says bank on the building, B-A-N-K. It's circled now with like a, a circle over there, the left circle. It says on the building bank, B-A-N-K. Now I'm, I'm telling you, look at this picture carefully and tell me when you're ready and I will flip this picture. 
and I will, and I will, uh, you know, show you the same picture from the same angle with one very small difference. I show this to groups all the time, and everybody gets close, and I always bribe them. I'd say the first one gets a, you know, I'll buy them a soda or something like that, and they, and they, they all come right ahead and look at this picture, and I, and I, and I, and I say, you guys ready? And they, after a minute, they go, yeah. And if you look at this picture now, I'm showing you the same picture from the same angle with one little difference. Look at it now. I'm sure some people here, even if they're not Sherlock Holmes, uh, managed to see the difference now. Now, look at the building on the left side. It still says bank on it. This is B-A-N-K. It's still the same building. There's a big concrete wall. Why? Because people on that street got fed up with, with feeling their lives are in danger and they're getting shot again and again. All they need is some silly argument to spark violence all over the place. By the way, on the left side, you see an arrow. There was a door. If their soccer balls fly over the wall, they can go get it. It's just a little scary. If today they're shooting, you don't want to be there. Now, Jerusalem, I'm assuming you guys, by the way, in the beginning, they built those walls out of, out of sacks of, concrete, sacks of uh, sand. That's what they used to build in the streets, sacks of sand. But slowly, those sacks started falling on people's hands and hurting people's wrists and uh, spraining the ankles. And they said, you know what? Let's just make it out of concrete. And they built the walls out of concrete. I'm assuming you guys heard a very famous song, Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, Jerusalem of Gold, by Naomi Shemer. She wrote the song about a month before the Six Day War. And the song ends, the first paragraph, sorry, in the song ends, I'm sorry about my singing voice is not the best. She goes, <laughs> The city which lays alone in all the hills, it's, it's a lonely city. And then its heart has, has walls. Nomi Shemer, we think today singing about the old city walls is what we assume because those are the walls we see. Nomi Shemer was singing about these walls because Jerusalem was a full city where if you live at the end of almost every street, you get close to the old city or close to the border, you see walls like these. You see children playing in the streets next to walls and walls and walls. You see sometimes whole streets, which got a lot of sniper fire, which built a wall inside a wall inside a wall inside a wall inside a wall. This is what she's singing, and its heart has walls. She is not singing about, about this, uh, you know, the old city walls like we think today. She's singing about people playing in the streets and in the background have walls. Now, after she wrote that song, a very, very, very famous man, Amosos, wrote to her, you know, that song disgusts me. I don't like that song. And she said, why? He says, you sing about how empty the city is? It's not empty. It just doesn't have Jews in it. It's full of Jordanians. You sing the... You know, the tunnels are empty and the walls are empty and the markets are empty. Their markets are full. There's lots of people going down to Jericho. You say there aren't any. There, of course, there are. It took her about two, uh, two months to answer him, but she answered, says, Amos, my friend, if you want, love your wife dearly and one day she left you, you feel really, really sad. You're sad. She left. You she took everything and she left. You, you're walking down the streets really sad. Would it comfort you if somebody would come over, your, your friend, best friend would come over and say, don't worry, she's, she's with the neighbor. He's taking good care of her. Don't worry. That, that wouldn't comfort you, would it? She says that for me, the city's empty. If there are no Jews in the old city, the city's empty. If there are no Jews that can go to, to, to the Temple Mount, it's empty. If there are no Jews that go down Jericho, there aren't, isn't anybody going down Jericho, as far as I'm concerned. Now, by the way, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem took an, a very uh, interesting program on the computer. It, it analyzes... Uh, PDF files, like files that are picture files, and it can find words in them if they're text. So they scanned all the newspapers in Israel in the past, you know, 100 and 130 years, and they put them on the internet. So it's very easy to find today. You can just write keywords, search words. If I write down three search words, Jerusalem, Jordan, shooting, I get 3,600 articles of Jordanian snipers shooting. I want, I mean, these, these things are from 1954. I have a newspaper articles one after another. No, sorry, 1956 from June. I have, I, have, I have one thing after another after another. I'm, I'm just scrolling through. That child has been shot by the Jordanian Legion shooting at them. Legionnaires shot at people visiting Hartsy on praying over there. This, this uh, newspaper article that I'm showing you now, for, for example, just for example, it says the three minutes that frightened Jerusalem. The Legionnaires, the Jordanian army, took off their kafia and put on their hats and put on their helmets and started shooting with no, uh, not analyzing where they're shooting, no lovchana, without paying attention to where. This time, two dead, four wounded. This is like a normal, if I zoom into the article itself, I, I can read, there was a 50-year-old lady, a little gal who was washing dishes. 
Suddenly she heard a bullet right, right through his, you know, her window shutters. And the second bullet hit her in the chest and she fell on the floor screaming. And a 14 neighbor, 14 year old girl heard screaming from the nearby apartment. She ran to go help her. And, this, and another bullet she had right through the shutters and killed that girl. The, the last thing I have here, what do you call it? The highlight in yellow says, well, the prayers didn't help. That 14 year old girl, you know, died on the operating table. This is like daily basis in Jerusalem, daily ordeal. This was a situation until today, 53 years ago. Now, 53 years ago, we got back into the old city. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm with your permission, I'm zooming back in. I'm going back into uh, what happened here in the Jewish quarter. Once we got back in, 1967, we went out for a really big operation, the Six Day War, a really, really, really big miracle. And we, we managed to fly our entire Air Force into Egypt really successfully. We had a mission. We managed to knock on ground 125 of their airplanes without them raising up into the air even, without dogfights, on the ground. We eliminated almost our entire Air Force. And that was so successful that we can allocate all of our forces to Jerusalem. And they allocated them after two days of fighting in Jerusalem. And not, I'm not belittling it. 180 people got killed in Jerusalem alone. That's in two days, three protective edges, something that took 52 days long. But what happened is they broke back into the Jewish quarter. They broke back into the old city. They got back on the Temple Mount. They got back to the Western Wall. They got back in. Now, these pictures are very, very famous of the soldiers, paratroopers running into the old city over here, and the paratroopers standing by the Kotel. These are maybe the most famous pictures of the Six-Day War. What's much, much, much less famous and this picture of Stempel, I happen to belong to that same company in reserve duty, so I know the people very well, even if they're in their 80s now or 70s. This, this is less familiar, this story. The same time the paratroopers got to the Western Wall, the Jerusalem Brigade got back into the Jewish quarter, which we had lost. The men you're looking now in the picture, all the way on the left, used to be 15. Do you remember I told you they rounded the people up in the Jewish quarter and told them you guys are leaving now? You guys will never see your parents again. You'll never see your families again. They were convinced. And they were screaming. One of those 15-year-old children went to, they, they didn't kill them at the end. They took them to Jordan and they sat in prison for a year. And after a year, they came back to Israel. There was a prisoner exchange. And one of those guys is right here in this picture, a 34-year-old man. Okay, his name is Eli Kedar. By the way, sad note, he died one, one, a month and a week ago. I gave a presentation. I was talking about him like he's alive because I got his granddaughter. Uh, like uh, two months ago, and I thought that he was alive, and somebody wrote to me that he just passed away the, the few days earlier. Anyway, this guy here was only 34 years old. 19 years later, he's not, sorry, not, only 15 years old, and he was taken captive. But when he came back, he finished high school, he joined the army, and he became what we call Miluim, a reservist. And 19 years later, he breaks into the Jewish quarter, one of those first guys into the Jewish quarter. And he breaks into the Jewish quarter, and he sees the Jewish quarter is all in ruins. I'm going to show you a picture now of a few old, old uh, Hasidic Jews who came back in there. What, what remained of the Jewish quarter that we see today so brilliant and vibrant, full of galleries. These are those people sitting by the rubbles of the Jewish quarter. If you look carefully around them, 91% of the Jewish quarter of today, the Jewish quarter, is ruined. The Jordanians moved on and they blew up the buildings, one building after another. Here and there, some Arabs broke in and said, I like this house, leave it, I'll move in. And that's why some of the houses remained. But most of the houses were demolished. And what I see today, 1970s, by the way, they rebuilt the Jewish quarter. If you look at it today, it looks like we, you know, beautiful. You, no remnants of the fact there was a war there. Or that It looks like we should take this for granted. And, 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 and that guy, Eli Kedar, comes back to where he was taken captive. And he sits in this area and he sees one building is still old and all the rest is rubble. And he sits over there and starts crying. Now, this is a regiment commander. He has 400 soldiers at that point under his command. He's a high ranking officer. And he sits there and starts crying. I don't think you can imagine a high ranking officer ever crying, but they do. He sat there and he started crying. And they thought he had heat stroke. It was June, it was very hot. They gave him water and, and they're spilling water on him and saying, UK, UK. And he says, You don't understand. I was here in 1948. I was here, I, my brother and me were taken captive. My dad, I lost my, my, my sisters here. I thought they would never see them again. Come, let's go say Kaddish by that grave. Let's go say Kaddish by the communal grave. And he walks into the side and he says, Kaddish, for the first time in 19 years, they didn't have an opportunity to. Now they finally did. They could say Kaddish for the first time in 19 years. And what happened 
as, as he goes and he's crying and he says, you don't even understand, my house is still standing. And they say, which house is yours? And he, he points in all the rubble to the one house still standing, the house with the arches. And they say, really, you lived here? And he says, yeah, I lived on the second door on the right. And they say, no way, somebody's living in your house. And he says, how do you know? He, they say, well, there's a wire with laundry on it that's dripping water. Somebody did the wash today. There's somebody's living in your house. And he says, oh my gosh, follow me. He takes four, four or five soldiers with him. And they go and they knock on the door. And this big Arab guy opens the door and he says, who are you? He says, I'm, I'm Eli, who are you? He says, Mustafa, nice to meet you. He says, guys, we're back. The Jewish quarters, re get out of here. He says, what do you mean? He says, this is my house. I used to live here. And he says, are you real? And he says, I'll tell you who lived door next to you. Chaim Lepsegal here, Nacham Bornstein here, Sami Levi, man. I'm not, not lying to you. This is the Kedar family's house. Get out. You stole our house. And the Jewish quarter is rebuilt. We walk around there today. We don't even imagine that that was like a real war and like really, really badly going. Now, one of the families that lives in that house, in that, in that plaza, put, put a, a verse from the Bible near their house. It's so, it's so powerful. It says, there will be children playing once again in the streets of Jerusalem. It says, I'm quoting in Hebrew and then in English. It says, So said the Lord of hosts. You'll have men and women walking through the streets of Jerusalem. Boys and girls will be playing through the streets in the saddest place where hundreds of kids were convinced that they're going to lose their dad or lose their mom and never seeing their, children, their older brothers again, their older siblings. Today, I have not one, but I have two schoolyards. The bells ring and hundreds of kids play there every recess. In the afternoon, locals play there. It's so, it's so vibrant. It's so beautiful. And I, I don't think there's one verse more fitting that you can actually see. This, if you ask me, what you're looking at, the text is not the prophecy here. It's the, chil the child in back who's standing in the, in the frame. That's, that's the prophecy. To sit over there and see it actually happening. To see that kid playing in that street. What used to be the saddest place today, so joyous and happy. From there, I want to just tell you one story and, 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 and do a little short uh, closing. This picture here, you guys see a rough Goran at the Kotel with a few soldiers around him. The same paratroopers at the Kotel, at the same time Eli Kedar came to Jewish quarter, they came to the Kotel taking these pictures. Today, 50, 53 years ago. And one of the guys that was with him, one of those paratroopers that was there was a guy called Chaim Hefer. And Chaim Hefer wrote lots of poetry, really, really nice poetry. Now, it's hard to translate a poem because usually it doesn't hold together. But I really like poetry in Hebrew. And I, I spent, this might have taken me a few hours, but I tra translated one of his most famous poems. Those paratroopers came to the Western Wall and they all started crying. They got to the wall and started crying, crying, bawling. These are tough soldiers. These are 26, 27-year-old reservists. It's not easy to make 27-year-old reservists cry. They're a little senile on the cynical side. Why are they crying? These guys who were standing by the Kotel over there, were not standing there on behalf of themselves. They realized, or they felt then, that they were there on behalf of so many people who were never privileged enough to stand there. They never, they never had the honor. They never had the, the privilege to stand by the Kotel, to actually be there. Their grandmother, if you'd like, was not privileged enough, but they were. And that's, and that's, and that's what we celebrate on this day. Yom Yerushalayim is a day that these concrete walls fell. Yom Yerushalayim is a day that people were able to go to their grandfather's grave and say Kaddish. Yom Yerushalayim is the day that people went to in Jerusalem back learning in, in their campus of university. Yom Yerushalayim is the day people were able to go back to Dasa Hospital in Mount Scopus. Yom Yerushalayim is the day we were able to go back to the city or, or walk around Abu Tor without getting shot. And I'll finish with one little story that I feel really, really means maybe for one individual what Yom Yerushalayim means. That I once gave a tour and an older man, I guess he, he he must have been 75 or I don't know how old he was. He looked older. Sorry, he must have been, been less now that I think about it because he says he was a high school kid of 15 years of age in 1967. He was a 15-year-old kid and he hated his house. He lived in an, in an area that we called Yemin Moshe. It's a really nice neighborhood today. Very expensive and luxurious. But then it was living right across the old city. So if you had money, they left elsewhere. Those who stayed there were only the poor men, poor people, poor families. With no money. And he says he hated his room. It was damp, it was moist, and had no window. His sister had a window, but not him. And he hated his room. And a day after the Six Day War, today, 53 years ago, his dad came over and said, Son, help me out. He said, What? He said, Empty your cupboard onto your bed. 
He's like, why? He's like, just do it. He took all the clothing and shoes and put on his bed. And his father said, now help me push. And slowly they pushed away this gigantic closet away from the wall. And this child who was 15 years old discovered for the first time that he had a window in his room. It was behind the closet. It was full of sandbags. So bullets, if they were to be flying, wouldn't fly, God forbid, and hurt him. But when he was young and he was born, his parents put a cupboard there, blocking off the sandbags they put up there so that the sandbags wouldn't fall on him and injure him. This kid was 15 years old and only then discovered that he actually had a window in his room. What I celebrate today is the day I got back to the wall, but it's the day normality came back to Jerusalem. It's the day people were able to walk around without the fear of getting shot, without the fear of, uh, you know, having, having discovered that they have their backyards once again. Anyway, it's uh, almost Shabbat here. Um, and I just want to say thank you very, very much. I hope you had a very meaningful time. Um, and I hope this helps your Yom Yerushalayim be not just a random day, um, but be a, a day uh, of importance and a day that's actually a day worthy of celebration. Not just a day of uh, happy prayer, but uh, but really, really, really happy day, because it should be. It should be. So, thank you so very thank much, Eitan. Really thank it. you. Amazing. And uh, yeah. really amazing presentation. Thank you. Really great. Eitan, could I ask you, I mean, we'll open sure. up to any questions. Um, sure. But uh, can I ask you, Eitan, um, if you can send out the uh, poem that uh, that you read, maybe you can send it to me? Um, it's not oh. written anywhere. Oh, uh, okay. I, I, I mean, I translated it years ago. Okay. Um, I just read it. I read that by heart because I've read it a million times before when I right. when I guide groups. Um, it's not written anywhere because it's mine. Uh, uh, I, I can send okay. it to you later on WhatsApp if you want. No, it's very good. Okay, that's that sounds good. All right, does anybody have any questions? Um, you can uh, you can use the reaction button on the bottom of your screen. You can send the message to myself, David Asher, if you have any questions, or or to uh, Eitan. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'll just ask one question, Eitan. And we'll Sorry. stop a couple minutes. Um, what do you think is the most important aspect of the uh, the six day war? Was it being able to go to the Kotel? Was it kind of uh, being able to uh, have belief and confidence in our defense forces, or that our enemies knew about our defense forces? Is it being able to have tourists in the streets of Yerushalayim? Is it uh, you know what what was you know what's the what's the biggest takeaway from uh, from sixty seven? Um, wow, many, many, many people don't know this, but before the Six Day War, Israel felt in a uh, stronghold of uh, of annihilation. They really, uh, my 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 father was in a kibbutz then. He was taking <laughs> sandbags and filling up sandbags an entire night and and putting scotch tape on the windows. They dug out big parks that we have in Israel. And if you guys know Tel Aviv, Parker Quinn Tel Aviv. And a soccer park in Jerusalem. And they dug it. They, they literally dug it out, making, making room for graves. Their, their anticipation were 70, 80,000 casualties that week. Israel was in not, literally facing annihilation. Then we were very, very small border country, surrounded by Arab enemies. We had no peace agreements then, with Egypt and Jordan came much, much, much later. And Israel literally, they were all about bragging about how they're going to kill everybody how they're going to, sorry, and, and, and they were boasting about it. It's not like it was hidden or something. Not so saying, guys, leave Tel Aviv, get on a plane, go to America before death reaches you. That's what they were broadcasting in Hebrew. And so everybody can hear it on the Israeli channels, by the way. And um, so I think it, it's funny. We look at it today. We're, we're very happy that we can go back to the Kotel. But if you ask me, the fact that we won that war, the fact that we were so successful, the fact that within only six days, less than a week, started on a, on a Monday morning and ended on a Shabbat afternoon, the fact that we were able to go from disparity, like literally disparity. You ask people on Sunday, on, on June 3rd, how are you doing? And the answer would be, how am I doing? Like I just lost my house and my car and my family. Like people literally felt that way. And the fact that one week later, Israel multiplied four and a half times in size and got back to the Western Wall and won the war, the Arabs call it the, the Naksa, the defeat. The, 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 that's how they call it. If you ask me, just as much as, as, as that we're back on the Kotel today, yeah, yes, it is. 
But the fact that we were able to win that war, and people had the, uh, I'm looking for that word in, in, in Hebrew, tushia, the, um, the, the ongoing, and the understanding that, that I'm, back, I'm with the back to the wall. I'm with the back to the wall. The amounts of, of courageous acts that happened in the Six Day War that soldiers did were enormous. Soldiers jumped into alleyways where their friends were wounded and they realized they can get shot to try to go pull them out in front of gunfire. People jumped out of trenches and ammunition to go and save their friends inside, not because they wouldn't know they died, but, but they were going to die, but because, because they realized their friends inside will die if they don't. And after the first guy does that, so many others do that. Um, so it, it's like a, a second and a third. And right. the, the, that, if, if you ask me, that's, that's the most amazing. The fact that we won that war. Everything else is a bonus, even just holding up. Right. And you know, the bonus is a very yummy bonus. The fact we have the old city today and we have all these things that we shouldn't take for granted. We really should very special to be able to talk to you live from Israel on this special day. We have a question from Anton Weiss. Sure. Anton? Anton, you there? Anton Weiss? Okay, going once, going twice, twice. Anything else? Okay, all right. So I uh, just want to uh, kind of close this as uh, Eitan's going into Shabbos soon um, and uh, want to close this um, event down. A special thank you to Rabbi Trump and the young Israel of Warren Cedarhurst and to the entire male family. Uh, it's nice to be able to connect uh, Virginia to Long Island and, uh, and vice versa. Um, every day during this coronavirus that the building has been closed and we've been having services virtually, uh, our congregation has been saying, like many congregations around the world, chapter 20 of Tehillim. And one of the verses, one of the psukim in chapter 20 that we say for the coronavirus is Yishlach Ezra Chami Kodesh Umit Sion Yisadeka. So we've been mentioning Sion every single day. We've been mentioning Yerushalayim every day. Why is it that help comes from Yerushalayim? Why is it that help comes from Sion? And, uh, and from Kodesh, from the Kodesh Kadash, from Sion. So that's, that's the question. Help comes from Hashem, Hashem, the Shemayim, the heavens. Why is it mentioned Yerushalayim? And the approach of Rabbi Avraham, the son of the Gra, the son of the Vilna Gon, says that because the entire Jewish people turn towards Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim has this special power within it. No, no matter where we are, if you're living in Israel, you're living outside of Israel, we all turn towards Yerushalayim. So on this day of celebrating Yerushalayim and celebrating our presence, our renewed presence in Yerushalayim, we understand the power that it holds. And people around the world are saying, that we ask Hashem for help from Yerushalayim because that's where we turn, that's where our focus is. And uh, on this day, we say thank you to the Rebbeinu Shalom, to the Almighty, for giving us the opportunity once again to derive strength from Yerushalayim. And thank you to Eitan for giving us insight into the history that is the state of Israel and how Yerushalayim became something not just in our mind, but something tangible for us to be able to touch and to experience. And we ask the Kaddish Baruch Hu, to make sure that we can uh, get past this virus so that we can all return there quickly, soon in our days. Wishing everybody a happy Yom Yerushalayim. And they thank you very, very much. And thank you for participating. And uh, God willing, after this corona, may meet, meet you in Israel in uh, happy terms on uh, coffee yes. or walking around. And uh, Everybody, put, if you're here. in Israel, look up Eitan and, uh, and look up his, uh, his touring agency, Eitan Rund. And uh, we'll be in touch. Everybody have a wonderful day and a good job. Have a good job, it's Eitan. Hey, by the way, one last thing. If you guys have any questions, uh, both rabbis have my contact info. So you can easily find me. And you can ask any questions freely. I'll be happy, happy to answer. Thank you very much. And Shabbat Shalom. Good Shabbat Shalom.